This is Jack Jackson back with our fifth in our series of videos talking about uh, the concept of a definite integral. So in our previous examples we have looked at a function that was always above the x-axis or perhaps on the x-axis from the interval to a to b. And we saw that the definite integral could be defined um, as the area between the graph of the function and the x-axis over that interval. Okay. However, in the following example, we see that something slightly different happens when the graph of the function is below the x-axis. So let f of x be x minus 2 squared minus 4 on the interval from 0 to 4 and then graph the function. All right, the graph looks like this. So notice this time, uh, the graph is all below the x-axis. And we're going to notice something slightly different happens here. It's very similar, but, but just a, a slight variation. So let's try to make Riemann sums for this. And let's do uh, r sub 4, right? Uh, Riemann sum with four rectangles or four intervals and compute its value. See if you can do that now yourself. Do it yourself and then come back when you're done. Press pause now. Okay, so we, we go here and we want to make rectangles. And the right side of each interval is going to be where we're going to go down to draw a rectangle. So now these rectangles extend below the x-axis. And we get a rectangle here, here, and here. The third one is a rectangle of zero height, which is a line segment, which has no area. So this last piece is going to contribute nothing to the right Riemann sum. But when we start working out the details, let's work it out here. So we're going from uh, 0 uh, to 4. Okay. So delta x is 4 minus 0, b minus a, that's 4. And divided into 4 intervals, that's 4 minus 0 over 4 is 1. So each one of these is width 1. So 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, that's a width of 1 each time. f of x is x squared x minus 2, quantity square, subtract 4. x sub k is a plus k delta x, which is uh, a is 0, delta x is 1, so that just works out to be k. So uh, x1 is 1, and x2 is 2, and x3 is 3, and x4 is 4. And so we want to find f of each of those values. So we take this formula and we plug in 1, 2, 3, and 4. And delta x is 1, so um, I can leave, leave that out. So we're multiplying each of these by 1. Well, notice that the y values are negative 3, negative 4, negative 3, and 0, all multiplied by 1, and we get a, get a negative 10. Now, wait a minute. Areas are positive, but these numbers are negative. So we see that, that the integral, or, well, the right Riemann sum, here gives us actually negative numbers here. And so the negative 3 is the opposite of the area of this first rectangle. And the negative 4 is the opposite of the area here. So when we, get, when we uh, do this uh, formula here, the delta x is positive. But the f of x, f of xk, might be a negative number. And when it's a negative, instead of getting an area for a rectangle, we get the opposite of an area, sort of a signed area. Now, this, this happens... Um, anytime we're below the x-axis. So if the whole thing is below the x-axis and then we take a limit, what do we get? Well, we get actually a signed area. So here is that same graph and we shade in the entire area between the x-axis and the curve. But since this area is below the x-axis, the integral doesn't give us the area. It gives us the opposite of the area, that area with a negative in front of it. In this particular case, it turns out to be negative 32 thirds for the integral, or negative 10.6 with the 6 repeating. The actual area is the absolute value of that integral. The absolute value of the negative 32 thirds, or in other words, just positive 32 thirds, or 10.6 repeating positive there. And that's the actual area, but the integral is a negative. So we get a signed area. Now what we really get is a net signed area. So here, here's a function, 
uh, this particular one, uh, x plus 1 times x minus 2 times x minus 3. Notice it crosses the x-axis at negative 1, at positive 2 and positive 3, and we're going to integrate it from, uh, I said 1 to 3. I think I meant from negative 1 to 3. Let's fix that. Okay, from negative 1 to 3. And look at what we have. We have part of the curve is above the x-axis and part is below. So if we integrate from negative 1 to, well, to 2, then we get a positive value. If we integrate from 2 to 3, we get a negative value. What we get when we integrate all the way across is the sum of these two, which is actually this area here, the shaded area here, minus the striped area down here. Now notice the area that's above the axis is bigger than the one below, so the net result is a positive value. But this area here that's above is about is 11.25 in this particular case, and this one that's below is negative 5. Point, is is well, the area is 5.83 with the three repeating. There's the area there, but the integral is going to be the 11.25 this area minus this area down here. So what you get is a net signed area. You get the area between the x-axis and the curve that's above the x-axis minus the area that's between the curve and the x-axis, the part that's below the x-axis. So we end up subtracting those two. So one example of this would be back to our original example that we looked at when we had a, a particle moving or an object, a car or whatever, uh, some object that's moving and f is a velocity function, and x is a time, then the integral gives a net change in position. So if the result is negative, then the object ends up in the negative direction of its initial position. So here we're taking like motion in one direction, like down a, 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 long, down a long number line, for example. And so um, if this net change in position is this integral, and if that turns out to be positive, then we end up to the positive direction, like maybe to the right or east or whatever direction is positive, we end up in that direction. On the other hand, if that integral turns out to be negative, then we ended up to the left, west, whatever's negative, okay? Whatever the negative direction is, we end up in that direction of the, uh, where we started. So it's where we end up, not how much we traveled the whole time. Okay, now if you want to do a net area, then you just do the integral and then do the absolute value, which gives you the total. Uh, it's, it's the change in position, but then don't worry about the sign. Just take the absolute value of that. So the net distance travel will be the, the uh, integral of the velocity, and then take the absolute value will tell you how far you ended up from where you started. And it doesn't indicate which direction you ended up, but just how far. Now, what if, sometimes we might want the total area. You know, back on this picture up here, we might want to actually add these areas rather than taking the big one minus the little one here, or the area above minus the area below. What if we, how would we do that? Well, the trick there is to take the absolute value first. So notice when I take the absolute value of this function, this function in red here is f of x, and if I take the absolute value of that, I get the green one here. And notice when I take the area over here, now I'm adding these two areas together if I do the integral which the total area is 11.83 with the 3 repeating. And that's the same as the total area over here. So if I want to take the, the total area over here on the left, then I do the absolute value of it first, then integrate it. And so that gives us the total area. Or an example again would be, and if it's velocity and x is time, then if we integrate the absolute value of the velocity, this is going to be the total distance traveled doesn't matter, not, not how it relates to where we end up, but the total distance traveled. So like if you had your odometer going, this would give you what the change in your odometer is, even though, for example, the net distance might be zero. You might start at your house, go for a drive, come back to your house. The net, the net distance traveled is zero because you parked right back where you started, but the total distance traveled would be, be what maybe you say if you set your trip meter, it would be what your trip meter said. Okay, in our next video, we'll come back and we'll talk about approximating the definite integral. We've already looked at some ways of approximating it. 
we're going to see how we can refine those methods in our next video.